Hey there, misfits. This is Kate. And I'm Kale. Welcome to Horrorwood. singing in your head. Hi. So you got a new car. Indeed. I did. It is a very exciting time. It is. In Kale's life. In all of our lives, really, because Kale has a new car. I have a new car and it's it's a Subaru. Because she loves herself a Subaru. I sure do. I sure do. I got the Wilderness Outback um, by Subaru. And it's funny because years ago, I don't know, in the 20s years ago, I became a Subaru driver. That day that I went to go buy that first Subaru, I really wanted an Outback. Like that was my dream car back then. I wanted an Outback, Um, but it was out of my price range then. Listen, folks, when you're on your third Subaru and um, your previous one has been stolen, you just treat yourself and you get the exact car that you would like to get in the Subaru family. Um, Do me a favor. Say Subaru one more time. Maybe they'll sponsor us. Subaru. (laughs) Yeah. Are you ready for this episode today? I am. You're, can I, can I share your text? Yes. (laughs) Okay. Please do actually. So I talked to Kate and I was like, Hey, can we do this a little early? And obviously you guys know you've seen, you've heard me, maybe not seen me, which is good. It's a good thing. You haven't seen me at like 5 a.m. <laughs> when we've done some of those episodes, but it's, those it's are Kate's, fun though. I really like those. I know it's Kate's peak hours, not necessarily mine for the weekend. Here's to the freaking weekend. Yes. Oh, I just got sued. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you did. So I said, I can be ready in about 20 minutes because I had told originally told her like 7.30 ish. And that was probably around 7.30 when I texted her. She wrote, quote, this episode should be kind of fun. I mean, it's horrific, but dot, 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 fun, question mark. (laughs) Also, I'm drinking champagne because it seems fitting. Again, it's like before 8 a.m. And, you know, just haven't poured the champagne yet, but it's coming. So enjoy, Kate. Thank you. I will. And here's the thing. It's not even a mimosa because I forgot to tell Matt when he went to the store yesterday that I needed orange juice. It's just like fucking straight up champagne. I love it. I love it too. And I hope it kind of matches this episode because it does. I don't know what's coming. All I know is champagne's been popped. Well, I will say it's of the French persuasion. (gasps) So the champagne is fitting today. Oh, bubbles in a French accent. (laughs) But I won't be doing the accent. Sorry, folks. Okay. Well, actually, not sorry. You're probably going to be very glad I'm not trying. Okay, I'm waking up. I'm waking up. Peace. Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> I'm running low on champagne, but maybe that's good because I'm already like so caffeinated. And this was my second glass, but they're, I mean, they're small pores. They're very small I'm not small caffeinated pores. nor champagne. Just- I don't know what you're doing with your life. I'm probably going to have to edit out like so much of this intro because <laughs> it is going on for so long. You know... I like it. You know what? I don't mind it, but some people apparently do because we just got our first negative review, which made me laugh. It just said, y'all talk too much. What the hell? (laughs) And I was like, "Uh, we're a podcast. I don't know how to do a podcast without talking. So just this is just a fair warning for everyone out there. If you do not wish to hear any talking or see any closed captions, by all means, don't listen to this podcast because we are going to speak. Also, to our negative reviewer, I still love you. I do too. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah, thanks for thanks for enduring all of our chatting. It's feedback. One more piece of feedback we got. It, it was actually a question and it was a good question. Um, okay. So we always say like, hey, we're, we're going to put this in the show notes, yada, yada. And with Apple, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, it's pretty easy because you click on the episode and then it's just there. Like there's the show notes. You can scroll right, down. That's you see the, the one sources. I use. So you can scroll down. Yes. With Spotify, and I'm not sure about other um, platforms, but this is specific to Spotify, which is also like the one most of our listeners are on. Um, 
it's a couple of steps. So you click on the episode and then they give you part of the description and then you have to click more. So like you'll see a little area that you can click on and that uh-huh. will give you the full show notes with all of the sources. So it's ah. just like an extra little step, but that's how you find all those links. Cool. Also, we haven't talked about um, Lisa Marie Presley or Barbara Walters. Um, oh my gosh. Right. So like, I mean, Obviously, Barbara Walters was in her 90s, and I don't think that was, like, shocking to anyone. But still, was, you know, she was a pretty She's iconic. icon. Yeah. yeah. And then Lisa Marie Presley was just... Oh, did you... My thing just... I saw that. That was really bizarre. It, like, flipped. I'm trying or... to tighten it. Okay, that should be good. Yeah. Um, Yeah, Lisa Marie Presley was so sudden. She had just gone to the Golden Globes, and she's just like, damn, that was that fast. was That was a kicker. That's what it was just... So odd to hear the news, seeing that she was on TV like two days. Wasn't it two days? Yeah. Yeah. Before. Yeah. It was really sudden. So sudden. Yeah. And speaking of like shows and movies and things that are happening right now, we just finished The Patient on Hulu. I guess we weren't really speaking about shows, but I was thinking Elvis and that's what I got. Elvis, right, 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 right. Matt and I just finished The Patient. Have you watched The Patient on Hulu? No. Um, it is so fucking good, folks. If you are not watching The Patient, get Hulu right now if you're not subscribed. Find someone who has Hulu if you don't have it and watch The Patient. It is so good. It's about a serial killer and his therapist. And Steve Carell plays the therapist and Dom Hall Gleason pa- plays the serial killer. He will make you love a serial killer. He is so good. Do, would I know who this character or actor is? Can you say him again? Dom Hall Gleason. So he's actually the son of Brendan Gleason, who uh, oh, is in his name. the Banshees of Inisherin. Yeah, and his brother is Brian Gleason, who is Thomas Claffin in Bad Sisters. Are you watching Bad Sisters on Apple TV? Are you asking? Okay. Me or yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know not to ask you. Bad Sisters, it is so good. It's kind of like a murder mystery. Um, it's set in Ireland. Erin told me about it, actually. I was hanging out with her the other night. And it's phenomenal. So we are about halfway through that show. And it's uh, Bad Sisters. I can't say enough good things about it. It's so fun. And speaking of Erin, so she and I just went to see Chicago last week. Oh, oh, that's exciting. And I bring up Chicago because when I was researching this case, it kind of made me think of it a little bit. Okay. Interesting. And this case, I've been so excited to do. It is so wild. It's bananas. This is the case of Claudine Langer. Okay. On March 21st, 1976, shortly after 5 p.m., a shooting was reported in Aspen's exclusive upscale gated community known as Starwood. Renowned skier Vladimir Savage, more commonly known as Spider Savage, was found on the bathroom floor of his home, bleeding from the abdomen from a gunshot wound. Oh. Yeah. His girlfriend, French actress and singer Claudine Langer, was found slumped in the hallway, sobbing. She admitted to authorities that she had pulled the trigger, claiming the shooting was a terrible accident. But others weren't so sure. So I'm going to go through all the details of this case, and then I'll let you decide what you think. Okay. Are you going to like, I think this. What do you think? Or that? Or Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> it seemed pretty obvious, but yeah. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Too much champagne? Not enough? I'm not sure. Cheers. Cheers. Claudine Georgette Langer. We love a French pronunciation. Oh, yeah, I do. She was born on January 29th, 1942 in Paris, France. Even as a kid, she dreamed of stardom. Claudine wanted to be rich and famous. As a teenager, she began dancing on stage at the famed Folies Bergère in Paris. Oh, that's big time. And she was only 17 when she started that. 
And that's when renowned nightclub owner Lou Walters happened to catch Claudine on French TV and said, I've got to get that girl to America. Fun fact, Lou Walters is the father of Barbara Walters. R.I.P. Babs. Oh, yeah. Does she um, have a French father? Was he French? He was American. Okay, okay. But he saw her on French TV and was like, okay, love her. At the time, Lou was the entertainment director for the recently constructed Tropicana Resort and Casino in Vegas. So he was looking for acts to bring in. And he decided the Folies Berger was just the act Vegas needed and brought it to the Tropicana. It was the first time the show had been licensed outside of Paris. In 1960, at the age of 18, Claudine packed up and headed overseas to Nevada, where she performed as the lead dancer in Tropicana's hot new burlesque show. To give you an image, so the picture you think of when you think Las Vegas showgirl, like Mm -hmm. with a huge headdresses, the feather boas, that was Folie's Berger. And in some of the numbers, the dancers performed topless. One night, as she was driving back to her apartment after a performance, her car broke down. Lucky for her, she wouldn't be stranded for long because a limousine pulled up next to her and outstepped legendary singer Andy Williams. Oh, oh, because he, he was a Vegas performer, right? Mm-hmm. He was headlining in Vegas at the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He immediately fell for Claudine. She was stunning. She had the dark hair, the French accent, those big doe-like eyes. And she was a Vegas showgirl. She was sexy. When describing her, one guy said, and the way he says it is so funny, he goes, she gave off heat. Oh. (laughs) Uh, So Andy falls for her right away. That's the story they always told people anyway regarding how they met. But other reports state that Andy went to see the Foley's Bergere perform and was struck by her. That, to me, feels more plausible. I'm not sure I buy that her car broke down. He pulled up in a limousine right. and rescued her. Andy Williams had a real nice guy image going on. So I'm guessing he didn't want people to know he went to see a show with topless women. That's just my guess. Despite their 14-year age difference, Claudine and Andy wed in December of 1961. She was 19 and he was 33. The following year, Andy released Moon River, which became his signature song. And was also referenced in Sex in the City, so clearly we know it's like a big song. I mean, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Downhill Racer, it's been in a ton of, a ton of stuff. So he's a big deal now, and the couple moved into a big old mansion in Malibu. They sure did. The very next year, in 1963, Andy got his own TV show. Oh, the Andy Williams show, yeah? Yeah. And Claudine was a frequent guest. Yeah. Andy had become one of the most popular entertainers in America. And Claudine was getting into the music biz herself. She often performed with Andy on his show, and his success opened doors for her that I think would have remained closed if it weren't for him. I mean, she had a fine voice, but I don't know that she would have broken through mm-hmm. in the music business sure. in the way she did, had it not been for him leading the way. 1963 was also the year Claudine began landing roles in television shows, including McHale's Navy and Dr. Kildare. Everything was coming up Claudine. That same year, they had their first child together, a daughter named Noel, followed by a son in 1965 named Christian. In addition to appearing together on The Andy Williams Show, the couple also starred together in The Andy Williams Christmas Show, which became an annual tradition for several years and also featured Andy's brothers as well as the Osmond family, like Donnie and Marie and their siblings. Their Christmas show was the number one show in the history of television at the time. I read it took four Super Bowls to surpass it in ratings. It was very popular. Yeah. So Andy's got his thing going on with his music and his own TV show. And Claudine continued to get work on shows like Hogan's Heroes and Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. She also went on to record seven albums of her own. They were mostly covers of easy listening songs. That was her niche. She had a very soft, quiet voice. So it makes sense. Not in French. uh, No, some. I think a lot of them were in French. French. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that easy listening was her genre. Her 1967 debut album hit number one on the Billboard chart. I'm sorry. No, it did not. It hit number 11 on the Billboard charts. I misread that. 
It was a big deal because no other French-born singer had had this kind of success other than Edith Piaf. Edith Piaf's signature song was La Vie en Rose, so that's where you would know uh, her from. Yes. Well done, Claudine. Her biggest break came in 1968 when she starred opposite Peter Sellers in the movie The Party. She was the female lead. Andy and Claudine were America's sweethearts. Andy was a huge star, and Claudine, although she was more famous for being Andy Williams' wife, honestly, she did have her own credits to her name. And the two of them loved to party. They were vibing in the 60s. They also had famous friends and a shit ton of money, so they pretty much had the world at their fingertips. Poppin' bubbles. Poppin', poppin', poppin'. In fact, they were very close with Bobby Kennedy and his wife, Ethel. Like, besties. Uh Each couple often hosted the other at their homes. They would travel together. They'd take cruises together in the summers. And both Claudine and Andy loved to ski, and they'd often go skiing with Bobby and Ethel. Andy and Claudine were even at the Ambassador Hotel when Bobby Kennedy was shot. They were watching Bobby's speech from his hotel room because they had plans to go clubbing afterwards at this exclusive new club called The Factory, which was led by several high-profile stars, including Paul Newman, Peter Lawford. We learned all about Peter Lawford in our Marilyn Monroe episodes. When Bobby was shot, Andy and Claudine went to the hospital. They rode the train with the Kennedys back to Washington, D.C. to the funeral. Andy sang at the funeral. So suffice to say, they they had all been pretty close. Mm -hmm. When Andy and Claudine had their third child the following year, a son, they named him Bobby. After Bobby Kennedy? Oh, yep. that's fresh. Side note, Bobby Williams is the longtime partner of Marielle Hemingway, who we mentioned in the Dorothy Stratton episode. Just, yeah, it's just recently. wild. So many of our episodes intertwine. Like, well, And you also mentioned Hogan's Heroes. Yep. So this this episode has like Marilyn Monroe. It's got Bob Crane. It's got all those, Love it. all those episodes tied in. I like the tie-ins. The tie-ins are good. And then it kind of makes me like remember certain aspects Mm -hmm. of them or like name pops because as we know Kate is very much Hollywood and I am I would not call myself very much Hollywood well you have a lot of knowledge of Hollywood I have a lot of knowledge of stupid shit um (laughs) that's not true I mean you have a lot of knowledge it's not stupid shit well a, a lot of it is but more so, like, my knowledge is just, like, all over the place. And and you really can – you refine these Hollywood stories. Well, I find it so fascinating that so many of them are connected. Like, they all knew each other. That's wild. That's what's exciting for me is that I am learning so much. And I love people and their stories and thinking about things and how things intertwine. And so – it's always such a wild ride for me when you do a story and I'm just like, whoa. Yeah. Anyway. This one is definitely a ride and it's definitely wild. Yay. Uh, those are my favorite kind. <laughs> so Andy and Claudine have this beautiful family together. Three kids. They work alongside each other in Hollywood. They just seem to have this charmed life, which is why people were shocked when they announced they were separating after nine years of marriage. I'm shocked. My voice. Or did you see my my? I, I did. Like, I saw your face. You were like, oh. <laughs> Andy told a reporter, quote, the marriage wasn't quite what it should be. We were taking each other for granted, which, mm. you know, happens a lot in relationships. Yeah. I get that. Claudine told the reporter, quote, we split up because it is better to part before you get to the point of hitting each other. Oh, that's a statement. Which is like. Oh, we're just going to jump right to getting physically violent. Okay, Claudine. Okay. The two did remain good friends, though, and were committed to being there for their, ki- for their kids. Claudine continued working in L.A., getting acting jobs here and there, and she continued making music. Plus, she also kept appearing with Andy Williams on his Christmas special. NBC wanted the special to continue because it was such a success, even mm-hmm. though they were divorced. So... The two didn't try to hide the fact that they were separated. They just they just showed a couple who were making it work for the kids despite being right. separated. And and think about all the couples that have met on like the movie or their um their show, their TV show and gotten married or and then divorced and they still have to work together. I mean, they're professionals, so they have to get that. I mean, it does know, happen. Yeah, yeah. 
I can think of like several couples that that happened with. But things changed one weekend in 1972. Claudine attended a celebrity ski exhibition in Big Bear. Big Bear is a popular ski destination in California. That's It's about an hour flight from L.A. And it was there that she laid eyes on Vladimir Spider Savage, a member of wow. the U.S. ski team and former Olympian. And a great name. He does have a great name. Spider is a nickname, but that's what actually he usually went by. Vladimir Savage was born prematurely on January 10th, 1945 in Kibbertz, California. You know what? I want to make sure that I'm saying that correctly. I think it's Kibbertz. It's like not far from Tahoe. Your fate. What is happening right now? Oh, my God. Okay. I just searched how to pronounce Kybert's California or Kybert's California, and this is what I got. Kybert's California. Kybert's California. The great place to visit. Um. Um. <laughs> From now on, when somebody asks where I live, I'm going to say, California. I can't even oh, do it. Oh, great justice. place to visit. To visit. I, I, can't, I can't. I, can't I love when it. computers like, <laughs> give you. It's just what? <sighs> that was refreshing. Because he was a preemie, he had very thin arms and legs at the time of his birth. And his dad said he looked like a spider, which is where he got his oh, nickname. Oh, the name. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. that's cute. Okay. Spider and his family lived near the Edelweiss ski area. And he, along with his sister Mary and brother Steve, all began skiing when they were kids. It doesn't sound like Mary really stuck with it, but Spider and Steve became little stars of this Edelweiss ski area. Both were altar boys at the Catholic church across the highway. And as soon as mass was over, they would run over to put on their ski equipment. Oh. By the early 1960s, the two boys had become top junior ski racers in Northern California, winning one competition after another. And both were offered skiing scholarships to the University of Colorado in Boulder. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Spider majored in aeronautical engineering. Okay. Okay, Spider. Bob Biotti was the head coach of the skiing program at the university, as well as the head coach of the U.S. ski team. Oh, excellent. If, if you were a young skier, you hoped to be accepted into the University of Colorado. Like, that was, that was your dream because they had one of the most dominant ski programs around. And the national team was made up mostly of the university students. That's amazing. While there, Spider befriended fellow skier and Olympian Billy Kidd. The two of them liked to party. Billy said of Spider, he had that legendary status as a guy who parties the whole night before a race, barely made it to the course on time, and still won. And girls were of course, of course. instantly drawn to him. He had a good time. So good, in fact, that in 1967, he hooked up with his friend Dee Dee Brinkman and she became pregnant. Oh. However, she was engaged to another man at the time. So it was oh. kind of scandalous. And Spider was focused in on his sport. So the two decided not to tell anyone that he was the father. Oh. However, he and Dee Dee did remain friends. And his daughter, Missy, did have a relationship with him, but she wasn't told he was her father until years after his death. So that's just a little side note. Oh, okay. But at least they had a relationship. Yes. I mean, yeah. Ugh. Spider won himself a place on the national team, but unfortunately, his brother Steve's career ended before it could really begin because of a knee injury. Huh, I know about those. Yeah. Spider, however, wasn't slowing down. He raced in several World Cup competitions, and in 1968, at the age of 22, he competed in the Olympics, placing fifth in the slalom. I was going to ask if he ever went into the Olympics. He did, in the slalom. Slalom. Do you like saying it? <laughs> it's fun Hold to on, say. Hold on, let me try it. Slalom. Yeah, slalom. Yeah? No, I don't, I, don't, I don't get any perks out of that. I really like it. <laughs> Just me? Okay. Spider also earned his place as the U.S. downhill champion that year. Oh, Spider. Overall, he had 18 top 10 finishes in the Olympics and World Cup competitions. Wow. 
1968, Robert Redford and author James Salter followed Spider Savage and Billy Kidd around while they were on the World Cup circuit and the Olympics. And based on their experience, they collaborated to make the film Downhill Racer, which was a breakout role for Robert Redford. Okay. His character was partly based on Spider. The character in the movie doesn't have the personality that Spider did, though, um, but it was more based on his athletic skill. The skills. Right. Yeah. Between the success of the movie and the attention Spider commanded in competitions, skiing was becoming extremely popular at this time. In 1970, Spider decided to follow his friend Billy Kidd's footsteps and turn pro. His former coach, Bob Addy had started a professional league and he was like, sign me up. Aww. Because one of the things was, if you were an amateur, you couldn't have sponsors. Like you couldn't do have endorsements. So he just wasn't making money. And so by going pro, he could partner up with these companies. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Course. Billy Kidd won the professional world championship in 1970, but Spider won it in 71 and 72. ABC had a show on Saturday afternoons called ABC's Wide World of Sports. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't alive yet, but it went on for a long time. And the professional ski races aired regularly, which really increased Spider's profile. He was the golden boy of the sport. Mm. And just so damn likable. Plus, he was very, very sexy. He was your type, Kale. I know. I, okay, so literally she's describing this. And the more that you're talking, and I was like, you know, he sounds like my type. I was thinking about this. I was like, if Kale had attended the University of Colorado, like this is who she would have had a crush on. She'd be Absolutely. leaving him anonymous gifts at his dorm. <laughs> like what? he had wavy blonde hair. Of course he did. Very white teeth. Great body, uh, obviously. And you know I love good teeth. Oh my gosh. I, I am in love. You are. If only. <laughs> and I mean, he was very charming. So like you couldn't help Even better. Like, fall in love with him. <laughs> right. Nothing. Oh, a wavy hair. Like it just a, a wavy let me run hair. my fingers through. Oh. Yep. <sighs> Billy Kidd said of him, he was just instantly likable. A typical California kid. Within five to 10 minutes, you feel like you've known him for a lifetime. I mean, a California kid. <laughs> A California kid. Sorry, I had to. <laughs> so when Spider made the decision in 1971 to move to Aspen and build a house there, the residents of Aspen were beside themselves. He built the house with the help of his brother, Steve. It was a chalet in the exclusive gated community of Starwood and was located next to the home of Spider's friend, singer John Denver. Oh, wow. Putting the yeah. John Denver in there. Aside from California timber and curved stone walls, the house also featured a waterbed in the living room. You know, those waterbeds. You were sending a clear message when you put a waterbed in your living room. You were saying, this is where the party is. Let's have some fun. <laughs> like, you're not even trying let's, to hide it. Let's roll on some waves. <laughs> and Spider loved to party. He was always the life of the party. He was Aspen's most famous resident at the time. By 1972, when he was just 27 years old, Spider was the richest professional skier there was, mainly from all of his endorsements. Right. At this time, he was professional. He was still competing, but he wasn't um, able to do the Olympics anymore if you were a professional at the time. He couldn't do the Olympics, but he's on the professional league, and so he was the champion in 71 and 72. Okay. All right. One racing director said of him, he loved people and could sell anything to anyone. And Spider knew that success wasn't just about winning a race. Like, he knew the work that went into it. It was about mm -hmm. connecting with people. You have to work with advertisers. He's going to trade shows. He's going to press conferences. He made sure to connect with his fans. If it was a kid that wanted his autograph, he would kneel down to get eye level with the kid so he could talk I to them. That. He was willing to put in the work it took to be successful. So that's just a little background to give you an idea of the kind of guy he was. He did not have enemies. He was incredibly approachable. You just wanted to be around him. Oh, and one more thing. He also earned his pilot's license, bought a plane, and flew himself to his races. Of course he did. Uh, by the way, I had to. I did you just look at a picture? Yeah. Oh, I'm, oh, my God. 
You're in like, love. He is my dream boy right there. He his is smile very cute. is contagious. Like I smiled mm-hmm. when I saw his smile and his eyes and his everything. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> and his everything. <laughs> yeah, he was a dream boat. He was pretty cute. Part of the gig of the professional league was to do these exhibitions to sort of drum up pl- publicity for the pro tour. Sure. And it was at one of these exhibitions in 1972 that Spider met Claudine Langer. Claudine saw Spider and was like, damn. Mm-hmm. So she mm-hmm. goes to her friend. Billy, <laughs> Kaylee's like, yeah, I feel that. So she goes to her friend, Billy Kidd, and is like, hey, you got to help me out with your buddy Spider over there. So Billy says, I'm having a bunch of people over this weekend. Spider's going to be there. You should come. Convenience. I love it. The attraction between Claudine and Spider was immediate and intense. Ooh, magnetic. Like it. Yes. By the end of that weekend, the two were inseparable. Spider and Claudine turned heads everywhere they went. They were the it couple of the town. You've got the Olympian golden boy. You've got the French singer and actress Mm -hmm. who's also Andy Williams' ex. Both of them are beautiful. And in Aspen, Spider was king. Everyone looked up to him. Kids wanted to be him. He was always surrounded by girls and could get any girl he wanted. And he did get a lot of girls. Mm -hmm. More than he could really manage. So his brother Steve was always there to take some of the women off his hands, so to speak. (laughs) And a lot Steve, of partnership. <laughs> Steve did end up marrying a former girlfriend of Spider's, which is wild. Wow. But with Spider, the dating scene was all fun and games, nothing too serious. Mm-hmm. So when he got together with Claudine, the community resented her because she took oh, him off the market. Took, yes. Yep. Kind of like it makes me think of like Harry and Meghan a little bit in that way. Mm-hmm. They became big in the Aspen party circuit. I mean, Spider already was, but like now he's got Claudine on his arm. Cocaine was common. Alcohol was abundant. Mm -hmm. They lived by the motto, work hard to play hard. And they did seem truly in love. Claudine is reportedly the only girlfriend Spider took home to meet his family in California. Because up until then, he wasn't really a relationship kind of guy. He liked the bachelor life. He was in his 20s. He had everything going for him, and he just wanted to vibe. But he was smitten with Claudine, and he loved her kids, so that was important. That's huge. It wasn't long before Claudine was spending more and more time with Spider in Aspen rather than her own home in California. In 1975, her divorce from Andy Williams was finalized, which it, it's always bizarre to me how long it takes yeah. for divorces to finalize. It can be years. Because they split in 70. Uh, and Claudine reportedly received a $2.1 million settlement. Good for her. She took her money and the kids and was like, bye bye and relocated to Aspen. Moving in with Spider. They had been dating for three years at this point. Their relationship was intense and passionate. A friend described the pair's chemistry as nuclear fusion. We all all know those kind of relationships it's like when it's good it's intoxicating but when it's bad it's to watch out yeah yep raise your hand if you've been in a relationship like that me my hand is raised (laughs) kale's hand is raised we've been there once the couple started living together friends began seeing cracks in the relationship Spider's ski career was winding down due to a pretty horrific injury that occurred in 1973 uh, when he hit a bump in a race and crashed. He had multiple compressed vertebrae and hurt his neck, shoulder, and back. He was also beginning to have knee problems, not to mention that he had suffered seven broken legs early on in his career. Mm. So he could see the writing on the wall, but he was fine with it, honestly. He knew his days of competition had an expiration date, and he was already planning his future with endorsements, TV commentary, ski area development, among other gigs. So he's like, I'm good. I got, I've got my future planned out. He ended up missing the entire 1975 season due to injury, but uh, he didn't mind because that just that, meant more time to more party. Time to party. Mm-hmm. Of course, now he's got this live-in girlfriend and her three kids under the age of 12 at home. 
And I think Claudine thought Spider was just going to turn all of his attention to her. But instead, he was like, I'm young, rich and hot, and I'm going out. As you can imagine, Claudine didn't like this too much. She knew how charming he could be. She knew other women were constantly throwing themselves at him. Meanwhile, she's left alone at home with these three kids. And their friends started noticing that she was becoming more and more jealous and possessive. Mm, Yeah, that's... Never good. Uh, Yeah. Bad sign. Red flag. At a party in which Claudine was in attendance, Spider was talking to some friends while she's kind of sitting off to the side. And I guess she felt like he was ignoring her. So she stands up and walks over to him and throws her glass of wine in his face in front of everyone. Oh. And Spider made a comment to his friends. He's like, excuse me, guys, looks like Claudine needs some attention. So it sounds like it was kind of becoming a habit. Yeah. And then I read in several sources, there was one particular party she'd forbid him to go to. She was like, no, you cannot go. It was a best breast party. Ah. Mm. Not best dressed, breast. They were going to rank them? I don't really know. Listeners, if you're out there and you've been to one, let us know what it is. I'm confused by the name because it's breast single as opposed to best breasts. Oh. Is it the left or right? I Do you choose one? I don't understand. Is there only one person there? Only one set of breasts? I would still think it's plural. Let us know. <laughs> and to be fair, I don't blame her <laughs> for being like, no, you can't go. I would be like, you will not be attending a best breast party. But it was just weird or interesting, I should say, because so many sources were like, she wouldn't allow him to attend a best breast party. I'm like, okay. One Aspen resident, Elsa Mitchell, said she had a bad temper, which we'd seen many Mm -hmm. times at dinners and parties where she would upend a table and start yelling about things. I think it was pretty much over and she had threatened Spider before and threatened him in front of us what she would do if he looked at another woman. Mm -hmm. I I see where this is going. (laughs) It doesn't sound super romantic. Right. So Claudine is really cramping Spider's style, but he tried to make it work for a while because he really did care about her kids. He loved kids in general. So he didn't just want to like throw them out on the street. Of course. After so much of her jealousy and negativity, though, Spider had had enough. He was a guy who was always upbeat and optimistic, and he just couldn't take her energy anymore. Mm -hmm. He was like, this is not a healthy relationship. He asked her repeatedly to move out, but she wouldn't go. In January of 76, he went out to dinner with his sister-in-law, who was also his ex-girlfriend, remember? And he said, quote, I just cannot get rid of her. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get her out. I don't want to hurt the children, but she won't leave. Tell me what to do. He's just had it. Yeah. In early March, he told Claudine he wanted her out of the house by April 1st. On the morning of March 21st, he decided to hit the slopes and then briefly met up with his friend and former coach, Bob Yaddy. Before Spider returned home, the two of them made plans to meet up again that night for dinner, and there was a trade show in Vegas happening the next day, and they were going to fly there together. Right. So Spider's like, all right, man, see you soon. I'm going to go home and get cleaned up. Claudine spent March 21st at an upscale local bar called Little Nell's enjoying some wine before returning home that afternoon. At which point, security chief Roy Griffith witnessed her drive through the security gate erratically and at a high rate of speed. Just after 5 p.m. that day, a call was placed to the Aspen Valley Hospital by a woman with a French accent Mm -hmm. asking Mm. someone to go to Starwood because there had been a shooting. Officers and an ambulance arrived on the scene. Lieutenant Bill Baldridge asked the security chief, Roy Griffith, to follow him to the home. And Griffith said to Baldridge, watch it. This gal is a little ringy today. Ringy. Which I'm not sure what he means by ringy, but I think I get it. I I think I do, too. And I want to put it now into my vocabulary. Feeling a little ringy today. Seems a little ringy. (laughs) When they walked into the home, they found Claudine slumped in the hallway, sobbing with her fists clutched to her chest. 
they initially thought maybe she was the one who had been shot. And the security chief said, who shot who? Right. And she replied, I shot Spider. Oh, she blatantly admitted it right there. She was visibly upset and led the officers toward the bathroom saying, in here, in here, help him. There they found 31-year-old Spider Savage lying on the bathroom floor, bleeding from the abdomen. He appeared to be getting ready to shower. He was wearing only his blue thermal underwear, and there were shaving supplies out, so it's believed he was shaving or about to shave. Mm -hmm. Wait, what was the weather? I bet it was cold because there was a lot of snow and it was June or it was March. (laughs) Claudine told the officers it was a terrible accident. She approached Spider with a gun because she wanted him to show her how to use it. He was going to be going out of town, which he was. He was supposed to leave for Vegas that night. Hmm. And she wanted to make sure she could protect herself and her children should she need to. She said the gun went off accidentally while Spider was showing her how to use it. She said they were discussing whether or not the safety was off, if the red button was showing, and she jokingly said, bang, bang, and that's when the gun discharged. If her story is true, why would you mention you jokingly said bang, bang? bang. bang. Yeah. Like, that just seems like something you'd want to keep to yourself. Yes. If it isn't true, why would she pretend that she said bang, bang? It's just a weird detail that... Does not make her look good. And and was that detail referenced in like some kind of court documents or? Sure was. Paper? Okay. Sure was. I didn't know if it was just kind of rumor say, but wow. Okay, Claudine. Spider did not have a pulse when they found him. They get him on the ambulance and Claudine begs to go with him. Did he bleed out? Because I think, you know, some people can survive these abdomen wounds. Well, the bullet didn't just go through the abdomen, which we'll talk about. Ah, okay. Lieutenant Baldridge sees how distraught she is and lets her go in the ambulance accompanied by an officer. This is a woman who has just admitted to pulling the trigger, but you're letting her leave the scene without questioning her? Yeah. Maybe Fascinating. maybe a, a poor choice. Yeah. Paramedics administered CPR, but when the ambulance got to the hospital, he was pronounced dead on arrival. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Aldridge and Security Chief Griffith begin searching the home. Unfortunately, they, along with other officers there, really bungled this investigation. Mm-hmm. Griffith found a 22 caliber imitation World War II pistol lying on the bed. So he goes over and picks it up and hands it to an officer who then puts it in the glove compartment of the sheriff officer's car. Um, it feels like Bob Crane all over again. Sir, you cannot do that. That's that's the weapon, guys. It's evidence. You can't just throw it in a glove compartment. The gun went unaccounted for for quite some time. I believe it was several hours, but I couldn't find exactly how long. Mm-hmm. When it was finally found, an officer who was not a gun expert removed the cartridge. According to District Attorney Frank Tucker, when they inspected the cartridge, there were small indentations where the gun's hammer would strike the cartridge, indicating the gun failed to fire up to five times, implying that the gun had jammed and she repeatedly pulled the trigger. So that's not just a little like, uh, he was showing me and I accidentally did it in one round. Exactly. I, I don't know which, I don't, I don't know gun terms. So uh, yeah. I might've said that wrong. I, I, sound good to me. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Lieutenant Baldridge sees a leather bound journal sitting on the dresser. So he picks it up and starts going through it. It was basically 225 pages about the troubles she and Spider were having. Mm-hmm. Lieutenant Aldridge Aldridge is reading this and he's like, oh shit, this could be evidence. I'll need a search warrant for it. So he places it back on the dresser. The officers at the home received the call that Spider had died. So they head to the hospital hospital, and as they're examining the x-rays, they see that Spider appeared to be bending over at the time he was shot. Like maybe bending over the maybe. sink, getting ready to shave. The bullet had entered low at the bottom of his rib cage, then went through his descending aorta. Oh. His official cause of death was internal bleeding. 
So Claudine's starting to look a little sus over there. Mm -hmm. And they start doubting her, doubting her story that this was all an accident. For one... Her comment, bang, bang. Well, they get to that. For one, where the home was located, there was a lot of security around. So there didn't seem to be any imminent threat of a break-in. Right. So Claudine likely wouldn't have needed a gun for protection. Right. Also, Spider was a skilled outdoorsman. And his father was a highway patrolman. So he grew up with guns. He knew all about how to properly handle them, how they should be stored. And it seemed unlikely that he would have left a gun somewhere where someone inexperienced could get to it, especially since there were kids living in the house. And Claudine's oldest, Noel, who was 12 at the time, was in the home at the time of the shooting. (gasps) Yeah. Oh, I hate that. Mm-hmm. I believe the the boys were home, but I think they were outside playing. You know what? That's that's the weird part. It's I keep thinking of um in Mexico, uh, um, Monica Burgos. Yeah, and her husband. Mm-hmm. I keep thinking of that. The kids were obviously on that vacation with them. Yeah. So it, then, in my mind, then all of a sudden, I'm like, well, you wouldn't you wouldn't do this if like the kids were home. Now it kind of takes a little bit out of it for me for her for Claudine. It's questionable. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I'm, I'm trying to build, I'm, I'm building some thoughts here. Yeah. So keep, keep it going. Investigators also couldn't figure out why Spider would have taught her how to use the gun right there in the bathroom. It, they right. thought, they said, well, why wouldn't she, why wouldn't he have gone outside? Which, I mean, I don't know about gun stuff. I, you know, if it's like better to be outside, I, I don't I know. Maybe, no clue. If they thought the kids I mean, were maybe, playing outside, that's a possibility, right. you know. And people, people do things like at their table and maybe she went in and she was like, Hey, I need to know how to do this. Blah, blah, blah. And he was in the bathroom about to shave. And like, then he was like, okay, I'll show you. I I mean, yeah, we don't know. Police drew Claudine's blood to test for alcohol and other substances. And they did find that she had cocaine in her system. So at 8 PM that evening, Claudine was taken to the police department where Lieutenant Baldridge questioned her and arrested and charged her with homicide and criminal negligence. Oh, right away. Right away. Claudine hired Ron Austin, who was a prominent attorney in the area. And although Lieutenant Aldridge booked her, Austin got her out on bond. At 10 p.m., the Pitkin County Airport opened, which is also referred to as the Aspen County Airport. Pitkin is the county Aspen is in, so it's like interchangeable. So the airport there, which is usually closed at that time, opened for a private jet to fly in. Can you guess who was on this jet? Bobby Kennedy. No, because he was dead. Oh, he was already dead. Oh, <laughs> man, I was so, I was like, I said that with conviction. You did. I, I mean, like, it, was, it was a good guess if it had been like 10 years earlier. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't thinking about the time frame at all. Like, I wasn't even putting a year into this. <laughs> um, Andy um, Williams? Andy motherfucking Williams. Okay. All right. Sorry, I just needed to get a Kennedy in this episode for some reason. <laughs> he showed up not only to support Claudine, but also to look after their kids, obviously. Yeah, definitely. At 11 p.m., warrants were issued to search the crime scene, and police specifically got a warrant to search that diary. The diary revealed intimate details about the couple's relationship and also noted the turbulence they experienced. One entry revealed that she was aware of a party that was to take place on the evening of March 21st, and he hadn't invited her, which made her suspicious of him. Yeah, it did. Yikes. She also wrote about how Spider wanted her out by April 1st, but she wasn't going to let that happen. She wrote that she was going to, quote, bring it under control and he was not going to dump her. So this is all shaping up to sound like a pretty solid motive. Sound like mm-hmm. a like a nice hot cup of premeditated murder. Uh, yeah. When news broke that Spider Savage had been killed... The community of Aspen turned upside down. And not only they didn't really care for her to begin with, now they really exactly despise her. Residents were distraught. They hated her. Nine out of ten residents believed Claudine was guilty of murder. Of course. On April 8th, she was arraigned on charges of homicide and criminal intent. She pleaded not guilty. And her trial was set for January of the following year. She and Andy Williams hired one of L.A.'s top criminal defense attorneys. Charles Weedman was the best that money could buy. So she's got Weedman from L.A. and Ron Austin from Aspen, 
Her defense team was strong and they immediately went on the attack. The first thing they did was file a motion to have Claudine's diary thrown out from the evidence. How? The police had specifically listed the diary on their search warrant. Claudine claimed the diary had been hidden in a drawer and police wouldn't have known the diary existed unless they had already searched for it prior to getting the warrant. Her team went a step further and said, we can prove it. They submitted the police department's own photographs that had been taken of the bedroom. Shit. The first set did not show the diary anywhere. An investigator said, well, that's only because Lieutenant Bill Baldridge had found it on the dresser and was looking at it, but he returned it where he'd found it on top of the dresser. He was looking at it when they took that the first, first set of photos. Yep. Facts. And that's when investigator Michael Fisher had taken the second set of photographs after Baldridge replaced it. But all this did was support the claim that police had taken it from somewhere. Claudine's claiming it was the dresser drawer, which would be private and protected. So the judge ruled the diary inadmissible. Mm. So the prosecution was like, well, fuck. Without the diary, they couldn't show that the couple had been having problems and that she was angry about Spider wanting to end things. Mm -hmm. So they're like, well, we lost evidence of a motive, but at least we've got the gun cartridge that shows the trigger was pulled several times. But the defense said, not so fast. What? And argued that the gun had been mishandled by officers the night of the shooting and was left unaccounted for for some time, which created a chain of custody issue. And because the officer who removed the cartridge was not a gun expert, his testimony was denied. Get out of town. This is insanity. (laughs) It gets so much more bonkers. So that took first degree murder off the table because the prosecution couldn't show that the trigger had been pulled more than once. So the only piece of evidence they had left, if you could even call it evidence, was the fact that she had tested positive for cocaine when police had drawn her blood. Mm -hmm. But. The Colorado Supreme Court stepped in and was like, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, you drew her blood without a proper court order, which violated her rights. So, yeah, you're not going to be able to present that at trial. So the prosecution is like, fuck. She had something looking out for her. Oh, she had the best team. I mean, keep in mind, they're rich as fuck. Right. Andy Williams is part of this. And yeah. He wants to protect his mo- the mother of his children. I get yeah, it. I mean, but, they I mean, had remained close. So he was in support of her 100%. When it came time to select a jury, people were practically lining up to volunteer. They wanted to see her pay. It was hard to get a jury together because it was clear most people believed Claudine was guilty of murder. And yeah. this was a small community. Everyone knew the people involved in this trial. Mm-hmm. They were famous and neighbors and whatnot exactly i mean everyone knew everyone and she knew that image was everything so she calls up sydney stone who is a self-proclaimed seamstress to the stars and claudine says to her i have to go to court you know and sydney said yes i know i think everyone does and claudine said i would like you to help me with court clothes So Claudine shows up to jury selection in like a baggy gray sweater dress. Sydney thought she should try to hide her figure and make her appear less glamorous. And Claudine was said to be fighting back tears as she held the hand of Andy Williams. So it was nearly impossible to find an unbiased jury, but they did eventually settle on seven men and five women. Okay. Like I said before, and we'll say it again, the town hated her, hated her. Not only had she taken their beloved golden boy from them, but she had also Mm. brought a media circus up on the town. Hunter S. Thompson, this is just a side note. Hunter S. Thompson was a resident of the The town. The writer? Yeah, the writer. Yeah. He lived in Aspen at the time. He had actually ran for mayor in 1970. Had he won, he would have actually been mayor while this case was going on. During this time. Mm -hmm. That's wildly fascinating. He wrote about it and he just said like how disgusted he was with the the whole media circus and how like Aspen basically had just shed on itself. Ugh. Yeah. 
Aspen was normally a very quiet place to live and to vacation. Like people just like to go there and ski and sit by the fireplace right. probably and drink their hot chocolate. Sign me up. But it was turning into a zoo because media from all over the world descended on the community. They were having a heyday with us, I'm sure. Yeah. It was reported that some of the locals even tried to run down the photographers with their cars and they screamed at them from their windows yelling, vultures, vultures. (laughs) It's like, come on, folks, don't try to run people down with your car. You're only making it more of a circus when you do that. And like you could also seriously hurt someone. Her trial began on January 10th, 1977, and it was the first big celebrity trial of that era. There really hadn't sure. been many of them at that point, especially not in Aspen, obviously. For the trial, Sydney dressed Claudine in a way to make her appear simple and quaint, quaint and innocent looking. Mm-hmm was how she described it. She wore almost like a schoolgirl's uniform. She wore pleated skirts, crew neck sweaters with Peter Pan collar blouses. You know what I'm talking about? Like the Uh, the black collar. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rounded, Mm -hmm. innocent looking. Very innocent looking. Mm -hmm. Girlish. But apparently the prosecution missed the memo that images everything. District Attorney Ashley Anderson showed up to court wearing jeans. Like, it kind of seems to me that he had just given up before the trial even began. They lost all their evidence. He was just like, fuck, I'm not putting a suit on for this. The defense team, however, was impeccably dressed. Everyone in town was talking about this trial. It was a star-studded affair. There were tons of paparazzi. Andy Williams was in the courtroom every day. And another guy who was in the courtroom every day in support of Claudine was... Jack Nicholson. What? He was a friend of hers. He sat right behind the defense table every day. Huh. The place was packed. Every single seat was filled. The prosecution knew they probably weren't going to get a conviction for premeditated murder, seeing as how they couldn't submit any evidence. Yeah. So instead, (laughs) they went for a reckless manslaughter charge, stating that Claudine was pointing the gun at Spider and knew it could go off. They rested their case after just two days, which I mean, it's not like they had a lot to go on at that point. So, yeah, yeah. that's true. The defense then called Claudine to the stand. She was so soft spoken that jurors could barely hear her and they had to lean forward to try to catch what she was saying. And she stuck to her story. She said Spider was in the bathroom and she went up to him and said, I would like you to tell me more about the gun and what the safety means. Like so proper. Mm -hmm. Not bang, bang. No. (laughs) Then she said that's when the gun discharged. Spider fell, calling her name three times, Claudine, 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 before going unconscious. She said the two of them were very much in love and the best of friends, and she had no reason to want him dead. She appeared very small on the stand. That was by design. Mm -hmm. She was meant to look like this gentle little woman. Her attitude was very much like, I don't know how this could have happened. And she said, quote, I have too much respect and love for living things to be guilty of that crime, and I am not guilty of it. District Attorney Anderson asked her, did you jokingly point the gun and go bang, bang? (laughs) And she replied, I wouldn't joke with guns. And Anderson said, let me remind you that two law enforcement officers gave sworn statements that you said exactly those words. And she just said, untrue. That's it? That's it. Untrue. Then Andy Williams took the stand. And he just kind of had an attitude the whole time, like, this is the biggest joke. And basically, he was only called to kind of give a character as like a character witness Mm -hmm. because he wasn't there at the time, obviously. On his way up to the stand, he passed by one of the court artists and he just said, make it good. Like, he just kind of had a cocky air about him. Oh, yeah. Whoa. And it was reported that he was pretty sarcastic during his testimony. I think he thought the whole trial was just ridiculous. The prosecution was trying to use him to poke holes in Claudine's character because, according to a neighbor, Andy had made comments about Claudine that she was, and this is a quote, this is not me saying this, Mm -hmm. that Andy had said she was, quote, a crazy type of gal, 
that like to ski fast, drive fast, and take chances. But Andy's like, I never said that. You know, it's so weird because this isn't like it's like some kind of like money laundering or, you know, case. This is a case where the result is of someone's death. It gets crazier. What? So both sides called their own ballistics expert to the stand. The prosecution's expert, Robert Nicoletti, stated that based on gunpowder residue, the weapon had been fired from a distance of four to six feet. And the prosecution said that based on the position of the body, which was found facing away from the weapon, and the distance from which the shot was fired, it made Claudine's story that Spider was showing her the safety on the gun implausible. Ah. She wouldn't have been standing that far from him if he was showing her how to use it. The defense claimed the gun had been fired from closer range and that its safety catch was defective. Their ballistics expert, Lama Martin, stated the pistol could have been fired without the trigger being pulled. But then the prosecution pointed out that in forensic testing, he wasn't able to get the gun to fire without pulling the trigger. So it's looking a little better for the prosecution with that one. Right, right. The trial lasted a mere four days days. Anderson's closing argument lasted 22 minutes, or as Weedman, the defense, spoke for an hour and a half. Weedman suggested the gun was practically like a BB gun and that Claudine never imagined a tiny little bullet could hurt anybody. He, he said, quote, this is a woman who is living, breathing, and suffering. And meanwhile, Claudine is bringing on the tears at this point. Yeah, of course. So Charles Weedman looks at the jurors and he says, mentally hold her hand and ask yourselves guilty or not guilty. While the jury deliberated, Anderson, the prosecutor, went to the nearby Jerome Hotel with some of the journalists and had a few beers. What? Yeah. He said, I think they'll walk her. They thought I was a dumb tuna. Oh, wow, man. This is a wild case. I am all over the place with my thoughts on this one. Originally, the jury was split. At first, four pronounced her guilty of the more serious charge of reckless manslaughter. Four mm. voted for acquittal and four were under undecided. The judge had also given them the option of finding her guilty on a lesser charge of criminally negligent homicide, which basically meant that she hadn't shown reasonable caution when handling the gun. Mm hmm. The verdict came back in under four hours. Guilty. Of the lesser charge. Criminally Ugh. negligent homicide, which is a misdemeanor. It was the lowest conviction the jury could find for her. After the trial, one of the male jurors stated, I wouldn't want her to go to prison. Heavens no. By no means is she the type of person who should be in jail. Okay. The judge, Judge George Lohr, sentenced her to a fine of $250 and 30 days behind bars in the Pitkin County Jail, which was described as being like Mayberry with really good room service. <laughs> judge Lohr also told her she could serve her time whenever it was convenient for her. And then a reporter stated that Ron Austin leaned over to comfort her. Remember, he's the attorney from Aspen. Mm -hmm. Leaned over yeah. to comfort her, but she didn't really seem all that upset. The community, along with Spider's family, was in shock. Yeah. There was hatred in that town for Claudine. But she didn't stick around to face it. Of course not. Instead, she decided to go on a little vacation to Mexico with her married defense attorney, Ron Austin. Stop. I thought you were going to say she decided to go to Hollywood so that she could be with her kids, with Andy Williams, blah, blah, no. blah. But, well, we're taking a different turn. Oh, yeah. So she goes on a little vacay with Ronnie over there. And when the two returned to Aspen, Ron left his wife and two kids and moved in with Claudine. And she hadn't even begun serving her sentence yet. Uh, Isn't that wild? That just seems like a conflict of interest. I don't know. It's crazy. When she finally did begin serving her time in April of that year, she showed up and was like, huh, the cell is kind of drab. Needs a fresh coat of paint. So she was allowed to paint it pink. Really? 
She also felt like 30 days was a long ass time to sit in prison. So she broke it up and served her time mostly on the weekends because the judge allowed that. And then she would go home on the weekdays free, you know, because when you kill somebody, sometimes you really just need your weekdays to get your errands done. Isn't that the craziest thing? I guess uh, we should tell everybody if you're going to commit a crime to do it in Aspen. In 1976, it seems like when it was the time to do it. I guess so. Spider's family filed a $780,000 wrongful death suit against yeah. Claudine, which was settled out of court. And part of the settlement was that Claudine could never speak publicly about Spider's death or their relationship. Allegedly, she was already writing a book about it. Because, of hmm. course, Claudine. After she was released from jail, her diary was returned to her and it's believed she burned it. Which, yeah, get rid of that thing. I would have too. So I didn't know that could something like that could be returned. Is it because they couldn't um, use it for like evidence? She was a free woman. Yeah. Okay. And it wasn't evidence. Yeah. Right. Hmm. One would think that Claudine would have said, you know, it's time for a fresh start. Everyone here hates me. I killed their king. I should probably move. She stayed. She stayed and married Ron Austin, her attorney. Oh. They actually live pretty close to where she shot Spider. They still live there. Oh, my God. Wild. People were not kind to her. Yeah, I don't think so. Upon her release from jail... A friend of Spider's filled Claudine's car with manure and poured wood stain over the paint. And for years, there were reports that servers at restaurants would, quote unquote, accidentally spill drinks in her lap or put something in her food. That's like some junior high, high school, mean girl shit. Which, if it truly was an accident, which Spider's good friend Bob Beatty thinks it was. Oh, interesting. It's Awful to think about what she had to endure. Sure. Beatty believes that Claudine was trying to scare Spider. Like probably maybe, they, you know, they were having a little rough patch or whatever. And that she was like trying to frighten him. And it had out a gun. unintended deadly consequences. Mm -hmm. So if that is what happened, I mean, who knows what kind of guilt and regret she has suffered all these years of course of course um but like i said she and ron are still alive and still live in aspen did they ever have children together i don't believe so i couldn't find that okay they keep a very low profile obviously on april 24th 1976 so we're going back to just a month after the shooting mm -hmm. saturday night live which was in its first season at the time aired a skit called the claudine langer invitational it stars Chevy Chase and Jane Curtin as commentators at a ski competition where male skiers are accidentally shot one by one by Claudine. It is wild. Shit, that's cutthroat. I can't believe they got away with that. Well, they didn't. They didn't. Okay. <laughs> they were threatened with legal action and producers issued a public apology the following week. I'm not going to link the skit because I don't want to get threatened with legal action. But all I'll say is Google. The Rolling Stones also wrote a song called Claudine about the case, which was supposed to be released on their 1978 album, Some Girls. But due to legal difficulties, it was excluded. However, the song is included on the 2011 reissue of Some Girls. Oh. And huh. Claudine's music can be heard in several more recent shows and films. In an episode of Gilmore Girls, her version of God Only Knows was featured. And Lorelai makes the comment, oh, is that the chick who shot the skier? Wow. Renaissance woman. She has a song in another Gilmore Girls episode, too, in season five. And she has a song in the movie The In-Laws uh, with Michael Douglas and Ryan Reynolds and also in Pineapple Express with Steph Rogen and James Franco. Wow. These aren't new songs. They're from her recordings mm -hmm. from the 60s and 70s. Right, I mean, right of she, course. They're just yeah. placed into these yeah. newer shows. You know, as I think about this and, and reflect a little bit mid-episode or actually end of episode, I'm, I, I think I most – obviously feel sorry and terrible for Spider's family oh, it's because awful. they just can't ever get away from this. And then she probably makes like royalties and they've lost their son. Spider's brother Steve said, 
It's a shame because Spider accomplished so much in his life. Oh, yeah. Claudine accomplished only two things, marrying Andy Williams and getting away with murder. Oof, I got the chills on that one. So what do you think? Do you think it was premeditated or do you think it was an accident? You, Kale. Uh, I mean, I definitely think she's guilty of an action. But was it intentional or not? I think, I think at the time, I don't know if it was premeditated specifically to be in that bathroom with that gun. I think people say things to each other and tumultuous times like, I want to kill you. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, or whatever. I don't know. Again, I, I think that people say things to each other in really rough times. And so maybe she has said something before. To him. Probably. I mean, based on what people said in her diary. Right. And wrote in her diary. But do I believe that she went in that day and she said to herself, I'm going to kill him in the bathroom while he's bent over to get ready to shave? I don't know. I, I, I'm on the edge of maybe not. And I'm more on the edge of she bought the gun for a reason. She didn't buy it. Or, or sorry. It was his right. gun. It was his gun. Sorry. She took the gun for a whatever reason she decided she was going to take the gun for, whether it be like safety, I need to protect my kids, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it may be in a moment of rage, she did shoot him. I don't, I'm not sure it was premeditated. In ways I thought maybe it was, but I think people act really swiftly on high emotions. So here's what I think. So when I first went through the case, I was like, oh, this was premeditated murder. Then after reading Bob Beatty's statement, I was like, I could kind of see that where she just wanted to threaten him and mm -hmm. didn't actually mean for the gun to go off. But the sticking point for me is that she said the reason she wanted him to show her the gun was because he was going out of town and she wanted protection. This was not the first time he had to go out of town. Mm -hmm. He had to do tons of trade shows. That was part of the job. So he traveled a lot. He traveled for races. He traveled for, um, you know, these appearances. And suddenly on this particular occasion, a week and a half before he says, you've got to be out of this house, she decides she needs protection. I, again, we don't know. Maybe she was threatened. Like maybe. And, and why wouldn't you have put that in? Like why wouldn't you, if you were on the um, stand, why wouldn't right. you have said, I was threatened. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but I do, I do want to say like I had a conversation with um, a friend yesterday in Santa Cruz and we were talking about animals and dogs and how um, it's funny because you can kind of categorize dogs by their breed and how their behavior might be. But I said, but they're animals and they're unpredictable. And then I said, humans are animals. Yep. And I said, we are the most unpredictable. Who knows? There could He could have just like said something and then she was like, had the gun in her hand and just did a reaction. It's also, I mean, knowing that he was so professional, both in his personal and, you know, and career, knowing that there are kids in the house, he's, he would not have had the gun just lying around, which meant she had to she go She definitely get it. went. To, yeah. Yeah. That seems very evident. Whether it was, you know, hidden in a closet or whatever. And I'm also not sure that he would have kept it loaded, even if it was hidden mm -hmm. away. Because, again, there were three kids in the house. Right. Which meant she would have had to load the she gun. She would have had to load it. I think it was premeditated. I will say she has served her time. And she is a free woman. So we're not here to get sued. Um, please don't attack her. If you live in Aspen and see her, yeah. she is a free citizen. It's just interesting how all that played out with Andy Williams. And then she's vacationing with her attorney and it's just a bananas case. We don't know all the details and the only narrative and the only story you can, you can really validate is your own. And that's the thing. The jury didn't get to hear her own story because she wrote it mm -hmm. in a 225 right. 25 page journal. Man, what I would give to read that journal. Yeah. Um. So we want to know what Crazy. you think. Absolutely. Do you Please think that us. it was premeditated murder? Do you think it was an accident? 
do you think she jokingly said bang 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 i know i can't get over that part which is just wild yeah you can tell us in the comments uh or you can reach out to us on social media, we are on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at horrorwoodpodcast.com. No, it's just at horrorwoodpodcast. Damn it. You could also send us an email at horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you're feeling super generous and you're like, hey, love the content, want more of it, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash horrorwoodpodcast. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, also... Yeah, yeah. If you're just feeling the vibes, we would love if you could give us a rating and review and subscribe. It helps us out a ton. We want to keep doing this. We have so many things like planned for episodes and just fun things coming up. So um, give us your love. We could use it. And if you want to tell us that we talk too much, you can tell us that too. I don't know if it's going to change anything because, I mean... We have to talk. It's a podcast. So uh, anyway, we hope that you are drinking champagne and not doing murder. And we'll talk to you next time. <laughs> Bye. Have a fabulous Monday, Misfits. Thank you.